Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. I have the honor of having Mr. Bill Ryman here. How are you doing, sir? Good. How are you doing today? Awesome. Doing good. We were having a great discussion beforehand, so I wanted to click on that record button and just uh, share all the nuggets. I, 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 I've been toying around with a, with a podcast behind the podcast, like a, like a vault <laughs> podcast, because some of the phone calls and the conversations before and after. But what I like to do with my guests is, is kind of let them tell their story where they want to start it, and then we'll kind of go from there. All right, cool. Um, yeah, I'm Bill Ryman. I am a real estate broker and a builder in Naples and Marco Island, Florida. If anybody doesn't know where that is, it's as far south on the West Coast, pretty much as you can go. Southwest Florida area. I uh, grew up in the business, grew up in construction. My dad was a been in the construction business since I was born. I mean, he started his own concrete company from scratch, started a custom home building for company from scratch in Illinois. As a kid growing up, I used to always go to job sites, always was around my dad uh, on the jobs and, and kind of grew up learning the business, learning the trade, just hands-on experience and so on. Uh, so I uh, love construction. I kind of always tell people too, when I was a kid doing it, it was kind of a love hate thing. Cause as a kid, you're, you're the labor, you're doing all the hard odds and ends that you don't really enjoy. Uh, but you grow into loving the business because you know so much about it. And now I'm passionate more than ever about it and especially construction and kind of watching being involved in the process, helping people, design and build custom homes and their dream homes and seeing these things come to life. So little quick story about me right there. So happy to be here today. No, I appreciate it. And what's interesting is I, we were talking about beforehand and we'll, we'll jump into the construction space. What I think I find so fascinating is the amount of time that it takes to build and the vision that it takes to build the custom beautiful homes. Cause Marco Island is one of the most exclusive areas in all of the country you really have to get in a relationship with these, with these clients. Like, I mean, a full, like, not only that, put it, put it in a different context. They're spending a lot of money too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's a lot of emotions on the line. And so walk us through, I would imagine when your career started that you were just like, I'm going to take clients like, and now we're in a place where you get to pick your clients explain it. I do the same thing with my coaching clients. I get, you know, I want to make sure that we have a bond. What advice would you give to entrepreneurs and anybody out there in the space of understanding that you don't need to take every client. You need to make sure that it's a fit. And and that almost matters more when you're spending almost two to three years with somebody. Yeah. Like we talked about before. I mean, it's, it's a process, especially down here, just because there's so much that goes into the construction. It's and people don't realize that come, we deal with a lot of people from up North. I mean, second homeowners, we call them snowbirds. They they're half, you know, half the year down here, half the year up North. And it's a whole different build process down here too. Just because of what goes into these things, I call them kind of mini fortresses because they're just pilings, a ton of concrete work, impact windows, doors, everything's hurricane rated. It's, it's just when you see these things come to life, you realize why they take the time they do. There's a lot of pieces to the puzzle. So you have to, you know, I learned over the years of doing this that the right fit customer does matter. Because if you don't have that continuous relationship and and you're bickering with each other, and so it's a long process. And you're even with them, like you said, you're with them probably a total of three years because you have that one year warranty too. But with us, you know, our company's structured to where we want to be with them, you know, for a lifetime that they're in the home to where, you know, after our warranty runs out. I still want them to call us if they need a plumber or anything like that. I want to build that continuous relationship with the client and friendship. So 
it's super important to work with people that you kind of mesh, mesh with. Um, I've learned over the years, we're not meant to work with everybody as sales, you know, as business owners, sale, we're natural sales people. We want to take on every house there is. We kind of cringe driving by our competition. <laughs> you know, we see the competition sign out front. And we're uh, like, uh, yeah. And, yeah, and it's I, like, uh, you learn though, you're like, okay, maybe that person would have not have been the right fit. You maybe, you know, cause you do have those customers that can be hard to deal with, but you get a lot of customers too, that are great. They're enjoyable along the ride. They, they trust you. Uh, they know the quality that you're going to deliver. They see everything that you do, uh, on your other homes too. And then the relationship and everything just goes hand in hand. So it's a big, big, thing to look for also and you kind of start learning that as in the pre-process as well well what's interesting to me as and and we were talking about agency and we were talking about just the real estate business in general and even you as well i think one of the number one thing that i talk to about young people and they don't understand especially when you're starting out is you need business right but i would imagine that you as a ceo and the the head visionary of your company, you need to create boundaries for your clients to, to make sure that they communicate properly, make sure that you can get your job done that you need to, and they're not over micromanaging. What advice would you give to, to agents or anybody starting a company to accept the business and, and need the business and cultivate the relationships, but not be like, I, I talk to people that are answering phone calls at 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night from clients, you know? And, and I think that's the hardest thing that people you know, walk that type of like proper communication, but not be, having their life run by their, by their clients. Yeah. It's, it's kind of setting the expectation up front. I mean, me and my brother both obviously work together, uh, you know, hand in hand. Um, my, it's a family owned business. So my dad actually st- founded the business. Me and my brother are pretty much running everything now. And we both set kind of our expectation with every client. So it's, it's like when I meet them at the introductory stage, I kind of tell them, okay, this is how it's going to work. Here's how we do things. This is how it needs to be done. And, and that puts in their mind right off the bat. Okay. You know, I can't go and talk to the subcontractors and tell them what I want and so on. And my brother says that too, because my brother's out in the field and he'll say, you know, um, he tells our subcontractors everything to call. If you get a customer that talks to, uh, talks to you, you need to just call me and tell me what, what's going on and so on. So a lot of what you said is that's so important within that's with every builder, or every business is setting the expectation up front with your clients, telling them how your process is ran, tell, showing them what to expect throughout that process, because it is a long process. There's a lot of moving parts uh, we also do during the process too, you know, at rough stage where the, you know, it's just studs, it's rough, ele- you know, the rough electrical plumbing, all that starting to go in. We do that walk through that physical walk through with them so they can see reality of the framed walls and so on and how things are kind of laid out without looking at a blueprint. Uh, they can see reality. They can say, okay, maybe I need a light here. I need an outlet here. I need to move this there. Uh, so that kind of helps with that process as well. So they're not going. So we kind of schedule out times, but we always say too that if you need to go over something, you need to call us ahead of hand and let us know uh, so we can schedule a walkthrough with you. And then there's you know three or four of our team members there that uh, basically kind of are there to answer questions, take notes give our give our kind of ideas on it and so on and that's what's important because you can lose control of a project real quick if you don't have organization especially a big home 100 percent, i love all of that and if if what do you think is the number one thing because like it's weird i'm you know i spent 20 years in the hospitality high-end hotels and, and selling wine and liquor and i i look at your as your business is you're kind of in the hospitality business, mm-hmm. you know, you're servicing a client. What do you think are the number, you know, one or two things that people are doing wrong when they're, when they're trying to service a client or, or, or somebody in their business? Um, one or two things I would say are wrong. 
Um, I mean, I'd say probably what I just said, not setting an expectation with the clients, uh, not telling them how their process is, just kind of agreeing to a contract and going from there, uh, not being organized throughout the process. I mean, there's builders that are building houses. I mean, monster houses, like 5,000 square feet plus that they're one man shows. And I don't know how they're doing it. I, I, we've made sure that we have the right pieces in place, the team members in place. So everybody has a certain job, uh, to kind of help the customer and guide them along the way. That's a big thing. I always actually sell on as our team and how we operate and so on, you know, and another thing would be that we're builders kind of get hurt too, is pricing, mm-hmm. uh, undercutting. I talk about this all the time because we get undercut all the time. I, I, I get people that call that want to build for a low cost price. I tell them it's impossible for us to even touch the project. I'm not, you know, I'm always nice about it, but I also try and help them too. I mean, you know, you're not going to get everybody. We talked about this, but you could at least help them or kind of guide them. Cause maybe in the future, they're going to come back. Building is a long-term business. So, you know, they can maybe not afford to build a big house right now, but in the future, they're going to make more money and they're going to come back and they'll be like, I remember that guy. He helped me out and kind of told me the red flags of what I should look for when I, you know, when I was asking for a certain price, you know, cause there's a lot of builders out there that I have no clue. And it's in every area, how they're building for the cost they're building for. <laughs> Bill, I had a guy tell me the other day. We were pricing out something and he was like, well, I get it done for like 60 a square foot. And I was like, get the F. I was yeah. like, what are you told? Like, I was like, don't even like, we're not even going to continue the conversation. That doesn't even make sense. Like, I'm not even going to like, I'm not even going to entertain that. And, and so like, I think that's the number one thing that businesses, I would say it's the number one thing that, cause it freaked me out when I started my, my coaching business and everything. Like, what is your philosophy on price as a company? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, that's the thing. It's like you, uh, you hear these people, like you said, and they're like, well, we're, I mean, I've, I've heard like 200, $300 square foot less. I mean, where we're at, like we were talking about, it's, mm-hmm. it's pricier to build and less than, and I'm like, I, you know, I was talking to another builder too. And he's like, I might have these guys start building the houses for me and just charge off of what they're doing. Because he goes for the prices they're saying they can build for these people. He goes, it's nuts. It's just impossible. But you know the overall strategy. You see this multiple times when things get busy. Builders all come kind of out of the woodworks. Our guys come out of the woodworks. They they you know start building homes because they think they can make good money. Unfortunately, the people that go with them, because when things come to a screeching halt and slow down, those guys leave. They go somewhere else. So it's a Rob Peter pay Paul strategy. I always say they're, you know, they're taking from the back end, paying for the front end to keep their processes moving because that's the only way they can do uh, and afford to do that. So, I mean, pricing strategy is key. I always tell, I'm always upfront with people about price when there's increases. I always tell them there's going to be increases or to watch out for certain increases. I got a guy I'm dealing with now. He wanted me to go. I bid his stuff probably, I want to say four or five months ago. Things have gone up since then. Lumber, trust, you know, every, there's been so many, there's stucco, drywall, all these different things keep going up, uh, in some stuff weekly now. And, um, I kind of laid out the increases I thought were going on and I haven't heard back from him. So he's probably going to go with a guy that's telling him that nothing's increasing and sure. he'll learn the hard way. So, yeah. You know, it's just, it's, it's, I always like the layout kind of once again, set the expectation where price increases can happen. I always kind of price out everything and bid it out as much as possible and firm up the cost as much as possible. There's stuff that are unknown. I tell people, I don't know what appliances you're going to pick, but I'm going to give you a good estimated price on stuff that's going to cover you for high end. Uh, Cause we've done this multiple times. Same with faucets and fixtures, same with lighting, same with cabinetry. So that gives them more of a comfort going into it rather than just BSing them and, and telling them, okay, here's the low, I'm going to give you the lowest price and then extra the heck out of you along the way. Cause people don't like that strategy. See, see you, you, know? you literally like took the words out of my mouth. I think that's a strategy I've seen, especially cause I worked in private equity, hard money space. 
they'll they'll get you in with a low price and then fee you to death on the back end. And, mm-hmm. and then you, but you're already committed and and now you're stuck. And I, I think that happens in I would say more in business than people realize. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's in building, especially, I mean, I compete with it all the time. Well, this guy's at this price and I'm getting this, this, and this. Well, what are you guys at? Well, I'm going to start you on the high end level. And then if you don't want it, but see, I do a lot of cost plus structure now because we're so custom, but I'm still pricing out everything high end. So I'll, I'll pre-price everything for them to kind of give them a comfort level of where they're going to be. Cause people's arguments, I actually did a podcast myself on cost plus first fixed and people's argument with cost plus is more, it's an open book. They don't, they don't trust it. Uh, it's an open checkbook. You know, the builder is going to just upcharge everything to make more money. That's not the case. If you have a good trusted builder, somebody that's experienced and knows, Mm -hmm. I I give people pointers all the time on how they can save money. I did it yesterday uh, with a guy I said on, on glass, it was on uh, sliding glass doors. He's Mm -hmm. got hurricane shutters in the back of his lanai. He had impact glass priced in on the back line. I, why do you need both? You don't need hurricane shutters and impact glass. I said, do non-impact. It's going to save you probably $10,000 on your back back Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, doors. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So he goes, yeah, yeah. You're kind of, well, why would I do impact? I'm like, I don't know. Some people just like both. It's uh, in my perspective. I don't think it's necessary, but it's up to you. Boom. Saved them 10 grand. So, I mean, it's just. We do stuff all the time that I tell people, you know, put the money here, move it there. And that's that's trust in a builder. That's working with somebody that, you know, actually cares, cares about the customer, wants the long term relationship with the customer, doesn't want to just have them open their checkbook, take the money and run. Uh, you know, it's, we have a reputation. We've been around for over 25 years. We want to keep that reputation. And that's why we've been surviving through the ups and the downs so uh you know just do your research is my biggest advice to people when picking a builder i'm helping a friend up in tampa he's about to build a house and i told him you know i'll look at some stuff for him because there's so many builders out there now because they all it's busy you know when times are like this and it's nuts all these guys start building houses so there's, tw- I, I know some young, young guy, we're super young guys building houses and, you know, I see what they do and I'm just like, uh, you know, a book, te- taking a book test rather than having an actual personal experience is a big difference too. So that's another thing. No, I couldn't agree more. Like on the surface, like who cares who the CEO is? Like, who's the building team? Like, have they been doing it for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? Have they seen, have they, have they been through different markets and so on? That is so important. Uh, I, a lot of people aren't going to build houses that are, you know, 450 a square foot to their, to their end consumer. So, but I wanted to ask your opinion just over and all, because you, you run this thing for your company. It, for obviously the investors or entrepreneurs out there that are, you know, whatever they're flipping or they're building houses that are 3000 square feet or 1500 square feet. What are the avenues that for you, where we are this day and age that can get the most bang for buck? That's going to stuff they should be focused on uh, in the house. I know everybody says the standard BS stuff, you know, your money's in the kitchen and the master bath. I know all that stuff. I'm talking about the stuff that maybe they don't see. Uh, Maybe it's technology. Maybe it's something that's coming out down the road. I know there's some cool stuff that you can add in a two, you know, 3,000, you know, $300,000 house that makes it feel 400,000. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's kitchen, of, you know, like you said, kitchen and master bath are always the focal points too. But I mean, having some detail in the house is, is always nice too. You can do ceiling details that are, that are cost effective. I mean, we're, we're seeing a lot of, uh, kind of coastal modern trends now to where you kind of have a kind of beach style mixed with modern where it's clean and it's just not super modern where it looks like a hospital you Mm -hmm. know it's 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 just a mix of kind of both but you know not the the problem with investors and that's why we don't deal with a lot of them i get calls all the time from them and then you know a lot of it's money and we just don't our reputation is we won't cut our quality and we won't cookie cut stuff. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the problem with investment homes is it's just so cookie cutter. How can I downgrade costs? What ma- cheaper material can I use 
to get the most profit out of it, which you can't blame somebody for that because that's the whole point of it. How can I mm-hmm. get the most profit? Mm-hmm. But if you're building a, you know, a crap house that's going to fall apart, um, how are you going to get more clients, which more clients wow. create more profit? <laughs> Uh, you know, and that's what, that's my avenue with it is please the client get more business versus some of the investors is put up as much as possible. Yeah. Who cares about the client? I just want to make quick buck. So, I mean, it's just, I, I would, the focus with us is you can do stuff like differently and add little things like spray foam insulation. That's more cost effective. That's more money than bad insulation. You can do, uh, better countertops you can do better tile selections that aren't just so, everything so because i've seen some of these investment quick flip stuff and it's just uh the i mean i'm pickier than anybody i mean i touch the looking at cabinets they're putting yeah. lowe's lowe's home depot cabinets in there and it's just like you know a lot of the fixtures you, you see walking through if you walk past the lighting aisle and lowe's you see some of the fixtures and fans hanging yeah. in there too and um you know, my, my advice is maybe try something a little more higher end. Um, you know, yeah. Cost effective wise, you probably, if you know how to sell a house too, if you get a good salesperson, uh, you're probably going to get more money out of it. Cause that salesperson can actually preach what's in it to mm-hmm. the people that come through the door. Uh, that's what I'm a big advocate on too. I mean, I, I personally sell our stuff, but I have a passion for it. I Mm -hmm. sell the high end. I sell the quality. I sell, you know, I'm imprinting in people's minds that we're not cookie cutting anything. You know, Mm -hmm. we're putting like in Florida, a lot of people use MDF on the floors, save money instead of using real wood. We're, We're using real wood. Why do we use real wood? Well, if water gets on it, which Florida has a lot of water, mm-hmm. uh, you know, MDF is going to blow up like a balloon versus a wood baseboard. It's not going to blow up. You're not going to have issues. So, you know, it's just in that cost us more money as a builder, but it's the little things that matter. Solid wood doors versus hollow core doors, uh, different, nicer hardware on the exteriors versus the cheap quick set hardware. No offense to quick set, uh, but you know, the stuff in Florida gets beat up pits rust uh outside because we deal with a lot of especially in the climate we're in we're near the ocean salt uh it really just beats up everything outside so putting those things that last outside don't do regular cabinets outside in an outdoor kitchen do you know some kind of pvc material out there that looks like wood we're doing plenty of that cypress outside on the ceilings helps the ceilings pop a little bit you know, and Cypress is bug resistant, weather resistant. So there's a lot of different things you can do. Are, is an investor going to do it? More than likely not. They're going to just kind of try and keep it plain Jane as cheap as possible and somebody will buy it, but they're not thinking about, okay, am I going to please the customer for the future? You know, they're more, what, what kind of fast return can I get on my money down here? So it's just, it's hard to say, but you know, that's why everybody says focus on the kitchen and the master bath, like you said. <laughs> well, is, if I'm not mistaken, is that on your shirt? Is that Arte Syndicate? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It well, it's a perfect segue into basically what you're talking about. This whole episode is not short, com- not, not taking a short view on business or your personal life. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I follow your content and, you know, uh, you know, your dad has started a company, you could easily say like, I'm just going to rest on my dad laurels and I'm just going to be a cog in the wheel. But I see you striving in taking the hard road and, and working hard, even, even though you've had some great success and, you know, it, is that just kind of how you were raised or is that something you've learned over the years? And, and, and what is it like being around, you know, a lot of my buddies are in that group. So what is it like being around, you know, high achievers like that? Uh, I mean, being the, the group I've been in for three years now, I mean, I highly recommend it. It's pushed me more than anything too, but obviously growing up, uh, business wise, I grew up, you know, working under my dad, my dad never handed us anything. I mean, that's, that's just the way it always has been. It's still that way to this day. Uh, you know, it's, he's made us work for every single thing, no matter what. And then growing up too, I mean, we were the laborers of the business. We had, uh, 
do all the odds and ends nobody wanted to do pick up trash on jobs i sweep them clean them all the time back you know and then dig ditches do small odds and ends touch-ups all these different things but you learn throughout that process too to respect the business more Mm -hmm. um because i mean you know being second generation i think a lot of second generation not all of them but a a lot are just handed a business and they don't have that respect for it Mm -hmm. uh for what we've gone through me and my brother have uh the utmost respect for the business but we also have a vision of growth for the business which is which is key too and you know, I want to grow it to other places in the state of Florida. I just don't want to be in Marco and Naples. You know, I want to expand a little bit more into Naples because our subcontractors tell us all the time for the quality and how we are and stuff. We need to get up there more. So been been working on that a little bit, but right now, you know, we're 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 pretty busy and it's slow growth construction. You, know, I mean, a lot of bit, a lot of people in construction move so fast. Uh, they try and expand and grow so fast and then they lose sight of the important thing, which is the quality and the finish mm-hmm. of the product. Mm-hmm. And we're just, I mean, with our punch out system, me and my brother are just nuts with punch outs. I've, I've done four of them on a house so far that we're closing on next week. And I'm going to probably walk through again uh, the end of this week and do one more because the painters are there now doing our current punch out. So you know, and, and that's the thing too, you gain that reputation as well. Like I, I had a person that was shopping us. They came up to us, they go, Oh yeah. Uh, cause I was talking about that system we do. And they're like, Oh yeah, we were at a car dealership and the salesman actually <laughs> used to work for one of your subcontractors. And we told them what builders were talking to. And when we brought your name yeah. up, they go, Oh, those guys are nuts. <laughs> you know, as far as punch outs, like yeah. and they're like, yeah, they used to, mark up everything you wouldn't even see some of the stuff and they'd put a mark on it Mm -hmm. which i'd see it you know and uh, like if there's a little thing on the wall i'll scratch it off and i'll tape it you know most guys would just leave that there but if there's a little nick that that looks out of place to me i'll tape it and the customer probably wouldn't even ever notice it but i'd still tape it so it's just you know we we grew up with respect to the business i think that's kind of where what brought us to where we are now and we still have that same respect. I, I want to grow it, but I've learned also a lot of patience in this business because you can't grow too fast because you'll lose sight of what your overall goal is, which is delivering a good quality product that people like and respect. So now I'm trying to really, you know, things are busy right now. I'm not trying to take on and get us overwhelmed too but i also want to take on to where okay i can hire somebody and continue to grow too if i have to so it's kind of in that stage right now as well yeah yeah and what's interesting about your reputation that's a funny that's i love that story is when i'm on my third round of of 75 hard and uh i did 150 days in a row so i did back to back 75 hard it's my first time i just finished yeah yeah (laughs) you just finished and and i uh long story you know we don't need to talk everybody knows about my story but i was an alcoholic for 20 years and a drug addict and homeless in my early days and and uh, i've lost like 70 pounds and Uh you know for me what's interesting about doing the 75 hard if i don't know if this has happened to you but some guy never met me and he was like no you're good and I'm like, what? He's like, no, you're good. Like, let's just have a meeting and have you on the podcast. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, I don't need to know you. He's like, if you did 75 hard, you're good. And I was like, <laughs> it's amazing when you get to like, are there certain things you put in your life, right? Or like how you are as an operator and, and those little details. It circumvents the, the small conversation, whether you qualify. It's almost like a qualifier right out of the gate. And it, it, it just endears you to certain people, customers and so on. So it's, it's almost like a a unofficial stamp of approval, I would say. (laughs) It it is. No, I agree. I mean, just doing that and, and talking to new people that saw kind of my before and after, and just knowing that I motivated people too. I had a guy in the gym that I know come up to me. He's like, man, how I started 75 hard. I was like, Oh, good for you. And he's like, yeah, I saw your before and after. I was like, man, I got to get on it. I was like, he's like, you got any tips? And I was like, you just have to stay consistent, man. That's, mm-hmm. that's the main thing. Don't let mm-hmm. the stupid stuff get in your, get in your way. And, 
and just stay committed but you have it's all about your scheduling it's more mindset mental than anything because in these and especially in this business too you know to get that first workout in and then have to span them out and space them out too uh it's tough. I, I mean, I remember walk, I did an outdoor walk at 1 a.m. And I was just yeah. trying not to get the cops called on me in my neighborhood. You know? <laughs> so it's just it, yeah. it, it's doing the things. And that's what the program's all about. I mean, that's and that's like the Arte thing, too. I mean, Andy Frasilla is, you know, he's he's been a big, big mentor to me. Same with Ed Milet. Ed Milet's changed my life in a lot of ways, too. I mean, I it's been a crazy three years since I joined that group and just meeting people. And it's so many like-minded people in one space to where they just want to do good too. And, and just, and just want to do business right and take care of people and not screw people over. And if there are people in the, in Arte that come in trying to solicit or, or, or have that mindset of just kind of, you know, they don't care about the customer, but you know, they ended up, they end up leaving eventually anyway, because it's not the right, it's people just, you can tell, I mean, you learn, but it's been, it's been great. Uh, just the, st- obviously the content you learn. And then, um, I'm going to be going up to St. Louis on May 18th to get around those guys at an Andy and, and, about a hundred of us or whatever for an event, which is going to be great and speakers and so on. But you just, you get put into an atmosphere that just constantly pushes you too, and just constantly makes you better. I mean, my Facebook used to consist of friends and parties and stuff like that. Now I scroll through and I'm like, man, I got to keep leveling up because I see all these guys with business, my Instagram too. It's like, I got to level up. I got to keep pushing. Well, what's interesting is people have it twisted, right? Uh, like we have an event coming up in Nashville and then Tahoe in September. We just did one in Austin and I've been a part of masterminds. You think that you're in there to listen to the speakers and don't get me wrong. That content's great, but it's the people that are in the group with uh-huh. you. That is the true goal. That's what you're paying for. When you, oh, when yeah. you come, when you come coach with me, yeah, I'm going to help you. But what you're paying for is almost my network. Like you're yeah. paying for the guys that I know, like my financial advisor who manages, you know, $2 billion, like, and knows everybody on the planet. Like you're, you're, you're paying to get access to that guy. And I think people don't, they don't want to take the time to invest in themselves because they see, well, oh, that's, you know, that's 500 bucks a month or something. And we're like, yeah, but that one relationship that you could make could make you, you know, $30,000 a month. Like, you know, like it's all relative. Like, and I look at a guy, like I don't do click funnels, but I, I read all of Russell Brunson's book. I'm mm-hmm. finishing up one now. I love his books. I've read multiple times. And that's a guy who's almost paid for almost every program that exists on the planet. He's, he's been through every click funnel. Like, why would you invest 13 bucks in a book where he's telling you exactly how to do it. But then I meet 40 year olds that haven't read a book since high school. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm just like, I don't understand. Like, you know, and, and, and so, you know, for me, it's really odd because we're so bit, you know, building like four different businesses right now. And I do large scale Airbnb management for luxury properties. It's what I've been doing for years. And if I didn't have the 75 heart, like, I don't know if I would be able to get everything done. Because yeah. for me, my day gets away from me. Like I'll, I have like nine podcasts today. I do them on Wednesdays. But like what I do is I get up at, you know, 4, 430 and I knock out, I knock out both workouts in the morning. And, you know, I'm already like at 630 or seven, I'm already like ahead of like half the society. You know, I met a guy yesterday who's got this big goal. He's moving back to Austin and he's like, I'm going to do this, this, this 21 year old. Got to love it. And he's like, he's like, yeah, I get up at 9 a.m. I'm like, done, bro. Don't even, I was like, bro, I was like, bro, like, I was like my boy in LA who trades, you know, $150 million apartments. He lives in LA and he's beat you up by four hours. Like it doesn't work that way, bro. Like mm-hmm. as my mentor would say, like, does your audio match your video? Like it's as simple as that. And I think there's a lot of people out there that, that want to talk about goals. And I think, especially in this day and age with Instagram and all that shit, there's a lot of people talking and there's not a lot of people working. Oh, and I no. think, I think, I think we need all need to shut, I need, we need to shut the fuck up and, and just let the results do the talking and, and leave everything else for everybody else to jabber about. 
Yeah. I mean, and what you said right there is spot on too. And, and since I've really started personal development, you really start seeing the type of people you're talking about too, that talk about it. They just, they talk the talk, don't walk the walk. And then you also start seeing other people around you just that are just going to live in that comfort zone are never going to change that are never, especially during 75 hard. That was one of the biggest things I got out of 75 hard is I started just realizing so much of how people truly are Mm -hmm. and how Mm -hmm. they are around me and so on too. And, and how they always make excuses, um, and so on. And I had a guy that talked to me and he said he failed 75 hard after four days. And I said, how? And he said, well, I, I got too busy at the end of the day. I had a real estate, you know, there was a call and, and, and I couldn't, you know, I just, I completely forgot. And I went to bed and I forgot to do, um, I think it might've been his progress picture. It was something, I think it was a second workout. Yeah. Second workout. I was like, how, I was like that you are making an excuse after four days of why you didn't get that second workout. in. I was like, there's no way you forgot that second workout, mm-hmm. you know, or, or that progress. It was just, you were making an excuse in your own mind of, okay, I'm only on day four. If I start over, it's not a big deal or whatever you were doing. I don't know. I mean, I finished it the first time I did it, but that's just how I am. Sure. I I don't like to fail. I, when I set my mind to something, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get up. I'm going to work out. I read Andy's book on 75 hard just so I I knew how everything was structured and so on. And obviously I had results in a lot of ways. And you were, like you said, it did keep a lot of structure in my life. I miss that in a lot of ways to like, you know, I just got done with it. I'm like, man, yeah, that did actually keep me structured with all that stuff going on too, you know, but it's, you know, personal development is huge. It's been a big part. I'm very grateful for it. And one thing that you said too, is like, people are afraid because they see the $500 a month or whatever you got to pay. But in the end, after you start personal development, that's worth every single penny. Cause I mean, as you go through your journey with it, you're going to spend more money because you see how many, how much results it actually brings. And there's no better thing to invest in than yourself. There really is. And I thought that was kind of you know, people would just say that, but now that I've done it and I continue to grow and I want to keep pushing and growing to the money, I mean, it's like what I put in, I get out 10 X. So. Well, what's interesting is we were actually in Miami this weekend and, uh, for a wedding and keep us game on Saturday. And we had a flight out at like seven 30, like Sunday morning. So we're going to be back in Austin at like two. So I'm like, okay, I'll go get the first workout in before we leave. So we fly to Orlando. There's a huge storm. We wound up spending nine and a half hours in the airport. Like we didn't oh, even wow. take off to like five or six. I don't even remember. Like we were supposed to leave at like 11 from Orlando. So we didn't get home to like 930. I've got a 6 a.m. coaching. I've got 15 Zooms on Monday and <laughs> it starts at 6 a.m. All my coaching and the last thing, the last thing I wanted to fucking do was get that outdoor workout in. But I got right to my apartment, hopped out of the car, got it in at 10 o'clock at night and then went to bed. And it and it just it, it blows me away because it's so it would have been so easy to just say no. Mm-hmm. But it blows me away. And, and somebody mentioned this the other day where my default is these days, like my default daily habit is, is clicked a savage at all times. Like when I look at my life in the previous setting, it's like, yeah, I rode, I worked out a lot, but not to this level. Mm-hmm. Like not, not, not to, I'm not reading as many books as I was when I was doing this. Like, and, and, and you know, what's the most alarming thing. I definitely is how I wasn't drinking water at all. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what's wild to me. And I think, I think America needs to understand that. I think that everybody's dehydrated. That's what oh, I yeah. like. And so it's, it's one of those weird like byproducts of this thing where you realize like my skin's better, like, you oh, know, yeah. all these things, right? Like mentally I'm there and like, it's in, in, in what Sweet. I preach and what I preach on my podcast. And this is what I preach is this is a lifestyle. Like, mm-hmm. they, like, like, yeah, you're an entrepreneur, but like, you know, people want to clock out like, and, and don't get me wrong on Fridays. I don't really do much as an, it's a free day for me. I can do what I want, but some days I work on Saturday, 
Mm-hmm. Some days I work on Sunday. I was in Costa Rica two weeks ago. I was looking at real estate. Like, am I going to go buy 2000 acres? No, but we, you know, it's like, Hey, I don't have 10 million right now, but it's definitely something I would want to do. You know, it's wow, a 50 room, hotel, yeah. 50, 50, 50 room hotel, but just having a conversation and being open to it, you have no idea what's going to be put in front of you. And I think they, everybody thinks that it needs to look a certain way, but, but, but like my, my thing that I say all the time, is like so many people create a business and then build a, a lifestyle around it, but you need to build a lifestyle and then build a business around it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's with your daily habits. That's with anything that you do. And I think we, we have this, we put ourselves in these boxes of, of, it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything for you. It, 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 you know, I, yeah, ba- basically comfort and excuses is, is the recipe for America. You know, we're yeah. so, we're so soft. We're so, you know, it's, it's, it's majority. I mean, and, and that's the thing you start seeing and especially with you, with you doing 75 hard multiple <laughs> times. I mean, you see, you see how people live the same. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people don't like change. They don't like, you know, I see it constantly too, or I, I know people, they just do the same thing every all week and then they go home and then they, you know, put their kids to bed. They have a drink or two, then they go to bed, they wake up, do it again. The weekends come, they go out to lunch or breakfast, they go out to lunch, then they go out to dinner and they drink and they, you know, and they just, they just, it's a repetitive pattern. Nothing changes. Nothing is different. And with me, I've, I've really, I like change. I like different. I mean, maybe that's why I started a side sports card business, you know, where I'm spying and selling yeah, sports I saw, cards now. I saw that. Yeah. Man. And I'm having fun doing it. And now I've turned it into a business where I'm making money and money's coming in and it's a side business too. And it doesn't take a lot out of my, my normal day of construction and real estate either. I mean, it's just a fun side little hustle that I do. And but it's just, you know, like you said, so many people just, they get comfortable. They're not, I mean, the water thing too. I realized that too, when I was drinking the gallon a day, I'm like, man, I got to consistently do this because you do feel better. You sleep better. You, you know, if I don't get that gallon in, I, I actually notice it in my sleep too. And, and in a lot of different ways as well. And, and just the reading thing, there's so many benefits to that program. It's, it's unbelievable. But if you just, and it trains you to consistently after I got done too, I'm like, it's always in the back of my mind of, you know, maybe I should read, maybe I should keep drinking the water. Maybe I should, which I'm doing it every day. Still, I'm not doing two workouts a day. I'm where I work out every day. Uh, cause I feel like I have to, cause working out just gives me that energy and everything too. But, uh, it's just, it's crazy. Um, like you said, how many people just kind of stay in that rest mode. They just don't really ever level up. They, you know, they're good with what it is. And I mean, if you're good with what, where you're at, good for you. If you want to get ahead, I mean, these are the, you got to do the uncomfortable things. Like, you know, you got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's how you get ahead. I mean, that's, it's plain and simple. And I'm constantly trying to do that every day, do new things, trying to figure out stuff where I wasn't comfortable. You know, I wasn't comfortable coming on people's podcast probably a year ago. Mm -hmm. I remember the first one I was on, it was horrible. I don't even think the guy (laughs) released it because I was nervous. (laughs) And, and I do them all the time personally where I'm the interviewer on my podcast, but I, being on them and being on the opposite end is different. And I remember the first one I did, I was like, yeah, this is different, but it was horrible. Even my first podcast personally, I, I launched is horrible. And when I talk about myself and everything, but I don't like to go back and listen to it. It's there. So, <laughs> you know, but it's just, it's, it's doing the things most people won't. And that's what gets you ahead and makes you stand out. No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's this is the truth. It's like I we, last week was my one. I saw two. Po- apparently, I'm a masochist. I have two podcasts, uh, and we started the, this one a year ago last Tuesday, and oh. I've re- I've recorded 240 episodes in wow. a year, and. I just don't care anymore. Like yeah. the repetitions, it's like, just turn on the camera. I don't even care. Like it's just like 350 episodes. And it was because I lost my job in private equity and I got divorced. And I was like, like, I'm just going to tell the story of like me re- rebuilding my life and just let that be the podcast and then let other people share their story. And what I've realized is there's, yeah, there's great 
gyms. There's amazing insight, but being able to give people a platform to share their story and get them come. Like we have a girl today who's coming on, who's in our, uh, we run a mastermind for, for recovery patients Mm -hmm. who have been out of recovery and she's a single mom. She was an alcoholic for two years. She's lost 40 pounds. She's sober. She started a business. She's coming on today. It's her first podcast. She's freaking out. And (laughs) I, and I'm just like, yeah, but imagine how many people that you're going to empower and, and who cares if you don't have 4,000 units, who don't, who don't care if you're a millionaire. It's, I think your story honestly, is more important to the average person to give them the strength. And and that's why this, that's why we do this thing. That's why it's put out here. And and, and I think you have to reframe the conversation and, and that's, what's exciting to me. And so if people want to find out more about your, what you're doing and your journey, how would they do that? Um, you can go, uh, I mean, you can find me on social media. That's the best thing at I'm Bill Ryman. Uh, that's on Instagram and then Bill Ryman on Facebook, LinkedIn, um, not on TikTok or any of that yet, but, uh, <laughs> YouTube, I have a YouTube channel. I'm trying, I got to start really dedicate some time to YouTube. I think that's important, but right now it's just my podcast, which my podcast is the real build podcast. It kind of talks about what to look for in real estate and construction. So very, um, broad as far as, I mean, I just had a mortgage special, you know, a guy that owns a big mortgage company manages $2.1 billion in money, people's money, uh, on there. I had somebody talk about when she, you know, she's a, short sales specialists on one of the ones before I've had interior designers. So everything with building, everything with real estate related is on that podcast. So if you're thinking about buying, building, selling a home, that's the way to go f- figure it out. Cause I've had a lot of great <laughs> people on there um, that yeah. know what they're doing in those industries too. Um, other than that, yeah, I mean, it's it, just find me on social media. That'll lead you to some websites. RKRyman.com is the business website. So I love it, man. I, I love this conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time this morning. I know you're a busy man. And uh, guys, if you like this episode, make sure you send it out to your friends, rate us and review us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on -on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.